Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Christopher Oscarson, Chip Oscarson, to you today. Um, uh, Chip is not only my colleague, but also a good friend. Um, not only, this is, this is one of the sort of weird things about BYU, right, where we're not only colleagues and friends, we're also fellow ward members. Um, and so we see a lot of each other. And uh, it speaks a lot, I think, to Chip that I never get tired of seeing or talking uh, to Chip. Uh, and he's, uh, uh, anyway, um, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He was a student at BYU, received his bachelor's degree in history, but while he was finishing that degree, saw the light and realized that comparative literature was the proper field for him to study, and so stayed so he could get a master's degree in comparative literature and uh, be ready for a PhD program, which he did at the University of California, Berkeley in Scandinavian languages and literatures, but also with a designated emphasis in film. And so he has always been interested in film and done quite a bit of work uh, on film. He joined uh, the BYU faculty in 2005, and uh, for much of that time since his hiring was the director of the Scandinavian Studies program here at BYU. And uh, now he is not uh, directing that program, but he is one of the co-directors of international cinema. And uh, of course, he's gonna be talking about that uh, today. But his research interests are in 19th and 20th century Scandinavian literature, silent film, and the relationship between literature, film, art, and the environment. And he's one of the leaders on campus of what we like to call environmental humanities. And uh, I think you will uh, enjoy uh, his uh, remarks today, but I won't take any more time away from him. So please join me in welcoming Professor Oscarson. Thanks, Stan. Um, it's great to know it's a, it's a low bar that, you know, at least I don't annoy Stan that he's, you know, willing to <laughs> hang out with me. It's, uh, I appreciate my, um, my relationship with, uh, with Stan. It's um, from, the, from the beginning of my time here, and even as uh, when I was a, a graduate student here. Um, sometimes when, um, when I address these, these kinds of uh, issues dealing with the environment, I, um, I try and and have a, a, a smile on my face and a kind of a hopeful uh, demeanor. Um, I'm, I'm gonna put a little bit of that aside, at least for the beginning of my talk today. I realize that this is um, a little bit of a depressing, and I, I thought that this image you know, perfectly captured that. We have, here we have um, 10,000 uh, pairs of elephant tusks that are being burned, um, which is kind of a, a staggering image that comes from this film, Anthropocene, that we showed at International Cinema uh, this year. The journal, uh, journalist David Wallace Wells begins his 2019 book on climate change, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life after warming, stating, it is worse, much worse than you think. The slowness of climate change is a fairy tale, perhaps as pernicious as the one that says that it isn't happening at all, and comes to us bundled with several others in an, in an anthology of comforting delusions, that global warming is an Arctic saga unfolding remotely, that it is strictly a matter of sea level and coastlines, not an enveloping crisis sparing no place and leaving no life undeformed, that it is a crisis of the natural world, not the human one, that those two are distinct, and that we live today somehow outside or beyond, or at the very least defended against nature, not inescapably within and literally overwhelmed by it, that wealth can be a shield against the ravages of warming, that the burning of fossil fuels is the price of continued economic growth, that growth and the technology it produces will allow us to engineer our way out of environmental disaster, that there is any analog to the scale or scope of this threat in the long span of human history that might give us confidence in staring it down. None of this is true. Um, Wallace Wells doesn't get much cheerier after that, he proceeds to march his readers through the scientific literature to outline both the direct as well as the cascading effects of accumulating greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And the outlook, outlook, as you know, is dire. Because of anthropogenic climate change, that is, change brought about by human actions, we, are, we face the likelihood of an increased temperature, um, even by some conservative estimates, between uh, 1.8 uh, 
up to 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 1 to 3 degrees Celsius, average worldwide with much greater changes um, experienced in the Arctic and Antarctica. Remember that this is a global average we're talking about, not, um, and, and you know, there, you have to leave all kinds of room for uh, spikes, uh, particularly in heat. Uh, we're looking at changes in precipitation precipitation patterns, more in some places and less in others, and less predictable patterns of precipitation, more droughts, heat waves, and wildfires at the same time that there are more floods, stronger hurricanes and intense storms that occur more frequently, sea levels rising between one and four feet by the end of the century, Some, uh, summertime ice-free Arctic um, by mid-century. These are just the direct effects. The secondary effects are likely to result in mass species extinction. We're already uh, seeing this uh, taking place. Uh, climate refugees from rising sea levels alone, uh, we're looking at 150 million people by mid-century, potentially, that will be displaced uh, by climate, that, um, by sea level change. That is, people who currently live at places that will be um, below sea level within uh, the next uh, uh, three decades. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of millions more by the century's end. 10% of all people on Earth live in areas that could likely be underwater by the end of the century. That is um, to say nothing of the hundreds of millions that could be displaced by drought, flooding, and war. There's new disease patterns, uh, both because of, of these uh, new water patterns, but also because new climates and migrating insects. Uh, famine, starvation, political instability. Uh, that <clears throat> what we're looking at is leaving a world uh, that has never been um, experienced um, by humans in their evolutionary history. Minute changes to temperature might sound minor, but they can have dramatic impacts on human communities, sometimes at great distances even from where these greenhouse gases were produced. One quick example, and some of you will be familiar with this, is Syria. The political repression in the February 2011 and. Uh, during the beginning of the Arab Spring, came when a group of young people were arrested and beaten for writing Arab Spring protest slogans on a wall. The Civil War, as we know all too well, is still raging today. Um, this comes from a, an NPR report talking about the origins, though, of this uh, of the Civil War, uh, interviewing Nayan Chanda, who's an expert on the region. Chanda says, Syria faced a devastating drought between 2006 and 2010, affecting its most fertile lands. The four years of drought turned almost 60% of the nation into a desert. It was a huge amount of land that could not support cattle trading and herding. Uh, Chanda says killing, uh, ended up killing about 80% of the cattle by, 20, uh, by 2009. Chanda continues, the water shortage and drought drove up unemployment and agriculture, so hundreds of thousands of farmers went to where they might find work, the cities. He says they were met almost callously by the Syrian government. He continues, people felt that they were being discriminated against and not being helped, perhaps because of the sect they belonged to. I think this dislocation and the dire condition created the first Stark and Dara, which is where the, uh, the Civil War began. In the years that followed, not only were hundreds of thousands killed, deprived of dignity, as well as access to the basic necessities of life, but you have an entire generation now that's been robbed of education who are desperate. This is fertile ground for extremists seeking to disrupt the stability of a world order that has completely turned their back on them. As of 2018, 6.7 million Syrians had fled the country. This is out of a country of, I think, 22 million to start with. 6.7 million have left the country, mainly to surrounding countries like Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. You know, countries that are paragons of stability, right? Um, you know, all around them. Um, but also a million to Europe, which set off a series of political crises. Many attribute the rise in extremist national parties across Europe to this and similar waves of migration. And this might just be the tip of the iceberg. Already very similar things are happening in sub-Saharan Africa, where climate change combined with poor governance is producing a powder keg situation of, mig of migration and desperation. So are you depressed? <laughs> are you worried? Uh, if you're not, you're probably not paying enough attention. My point in rehearsing the gravity and extent of the problem is not just to depress you into despondency um, and inaction, but rather to impress upon you the magnitude of the challenge that lies ahead. Humanity and individual people have faced challenges before, but not like this and never on this scale. So great is the challenge that it fundamentally tests not only what we think, but how we imagine our place in the world. 
One of the particular challenges of environmental crises like climate change in the 21st century has to do with conceptualizing it and representing it so that we can understand it. It challenges the categories, genres, and forms that our cultures have used to make sense of the world. Indeed, how we imagine our relationship to the world might actually be not just a symptom, but a cause of the problem. Greg Garrard describes the role of the humanities in dealing with ecological problems with an analogy. Weed is not a, bio a botanical classification. It merely denotes the wrong kind of plant in the wrong place. Eliminating weeds is obviously a problem in gardening, but defining weeds in the first place requires a cultural, not horticultural, analysis. He goes on to give an example of the example of Rachel Carson and how her book Silent Spring uh, from 1962 um, about the dangerous uh, use of uh, pesticides, quote, undertook cultural, not scientific work when it strove uh, to make the moral case that it ought not to be. The great achievement of this book was to turn a scientific problem in ecology into a widely perceived ecological problem that was then contested politically, legally, and in the media and popular culture. Thus, ecocriticism cannot contribute much to debates about problems in ecology, but it can help define, explore, and even resolve ecological problems in the wider sense." Close quote. How does one, for example, for instance, even imagine climate change. An individual's subjective experience of local weather patterns is not necessarily indicative of larger trends and conditions. Furthermore, most greenhouse gases are invisible to the human eye, and, and so the fact that we have over 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere can only be detected through a network of specialized sampling stations and satellites. The data points these systems produce only begin to make sense when plotted on a chart or graph and then we are dealing with a significant level of reduction and abstraction. When I think about climate change, I am forced into the realm of the symbolic, so think the scientific diagram, or the metonymic. Uh, think of images of melting ice in the Arctic or polar bears on, on melting ice. We've seen these things. I have a suspicion that this is a doctored image, by the way. Um, or this uh, image here, right, uh, which is a slightly more uh, self-ironic take on the polar bear's plight that builds within it the awareness of how these tropes are so obviously constructed by the human mind to provoke pathos and hopefully action. Clearly, there are problematic issues with, with this type of representation, not the least of which has to do with ambiguous research about the net effects of climate change on polar bears. But that really isn't the point anyway. That's not where I want to go with this. The bigger issue at stake is how conceptual categories and representations can limit our ability to perceive important facets of a situation or problem. The Arctic is a good example of this, as it is particularly susceptible to appropriation and misappropriation of many forms because uh, it's uh, because it is an imag it is imagined as a blank, uninhabited space outside of time, history, and modernity, a type of tabula rasa upon which human culture projects its own desires and fantasies. The fact that the Arctic is categorized now by many as a canary in the coal mine uh, in regards to climate change is only the latest in a long line of appropriations of this place. This projection is not without a scientific basis. Abundant evidence indicates that the Arctic is particular. Uh, particularly vulnerable to changes in the climate, and that tendencies barely perceptible in some parts of the world are exaggerated um, almost by orders of magnitude in the far north. Be this as it may, there is considerable danger in reading places like the Arctic only as a wilderness space. Distancing the space and emphasizing its geographical remoteness sets it up as a contrast to human culture and de-emphasizes the way in which human existence and prosperity has always been linked to places like the Arctic, even if those dependencies were only rarely perceived or understood. The impact of climate change will vary from one locality to the next, but the entire planetary system is com is compromised, and signs of anthropogenic changes to atmospheric chemistry are clearly recorded from the North to the South Pole. In a crucial way, this changes everything about how humans imagine their relationship to nature. And one way of talking about this paradigm shift is to talk about this particular historical moment as being that of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is a term popularized by Nobel Prize winning chemists Paul Crutzen and Eugene Strummer referring to our current geological time interval because human activity has so affected climate as well as other planetary systems that humans have become a geological force, having left a detectable signature on the lithosphere. 
these systems are are likely to deviate from quote unquote natural behavior for millennia to come. The planet is far past the point of considering how these systems function outside of human activity. Now the focus must be on how pushing beyond certain thresholds in fresh water use and land system and land system change, uh, altering genetic diversity, climate change, biochemical, um, uh, mainly phosphorus and nitrogen flows, ocean acidification, etc., put the planet at greater risk with high degrees of uncertainty about the future functioning of all of these systems. Insofar that the drivers of these changes are anthropogenic, we can begin talking about having entered into this new epoch, the Anthropocene. There's no consensus among geologists as of yet that would lead uh, to an immediate adoption of the designation for our current geological time interval, although it was officially recommended that we recognize the end of the Holocene and the beginning of the Anthropocene by um, the Stratigraphy Special Working Group on the Anthropocene just this last May. Regardless whether or not is officially adopted by a ge geologist, it nonetheless is a useful concept uh, for dispelling the idea that has been active in Western culture at least since the Enlightenment, that humans stand outside of nature or that nature is out there, insulated from modernity and human action. The realization that nature, at least as we imagined it, simply no longer exists, forces us to take new responsibility for our choices and actions. And this is how I want to talk about the Anthropocene today, as a theoretical tool that moves us away from a certain kind of thinking about our relationship with nature, when nature is imagined as something outside of ourselves or the places we inhabit. This feature, uh, this is feature number one, right? Thinking through the Anthropocene invites a recognition that we are nature, and that nature exists not only in remote protected areas like national parks and designated wilderness areas, but also in this valley, in our cities, on our campus, and even in this room. It soundly rejects the idea that there is an outside nature and an inside human or human culture. A second important feature uh, that thinking through the Anthropocene provides that's closely related to this first point is that we need to understand connectedness in a new kind of way. Everything is connected to everything else. Nothing is discrete. You can use the human body as a model. Uh, what is inside the human body and what's outside of the human body? Uh, the, the boundary between the two is far more porous than we, than we tend to, to think, right? And anyone who's recently contracted the coronavirus knows all too well about that, right? Um, this is not true just biolog biologically, but cognitively as well. Uh, we think in and through language and discourse that helps to determine what and how we see. Thirdly, Thinking through the Anthropocene requires us to recalibrate our sense of temporal and spatial scales um, and the rate of change. Uh, even our very concept of modern uh, progressive time uh, needs to be called into question. I'm going to come back to hit these in a minute, but I'm laying out the, uh, some of the main points that I want to uh, use in looking at the films here in a second. Uh, fourth, we need to recognize nature's autonomy from human will. It is not simply a resource to be exploited uh, on our whims. It doesn't uh, fit our definitions, uh, borders, boundaries, or categories. We need to learn to think past the human, or better said, to think of the human within the context of other complex agencies and, and other kinds of agencies um, that are fundamentally different than, uh, than the way that agency manifests itself in humans. Uh, fifth, uh, we need to come up with new conceptions of complexity and causation. Uh, there's a tendency for specialization in culture uh, and reduction in representation that narrows down how we understand uh, the reality in which, is, in which we inhabit. Um, we want to come up, uh, a simple example of this is uh, the way that so many films will, in dealing with environmental issues, want to identify the bad guy, right? Uh, that there's a single cause for the pollution, that there's a single cause uh, for the problem. But, um, but what we're looking looking at and dealing with um, is in a realm of complexity that doesn't allow for that kind of causation. Sixth, uh, we need to understand issues of dis dispersed complicity. We understand ethics based on uh, more on individual uh, love thy neighbor, where our neighbor is someone that we can see or at least theoretically meet. Uh, but what about when they're far away? Uh, what about <coughs> when... Um, Deciding to drive my, my child to soccer practice is not intended to cause harm, but the collective accumulation of soccer practices, commutes to work, um, and trips to the store have dire consequences uh, for people that I'll never meet. 
uh, I, I am part of and constituted by a system. Uh, there's not a question of just opting out, right? The into the wild kind of model, I'm gonna go you know, kind of live in Alaska. Th this isn't an option, right? That we're all part of this, of this system. We've benefited from it and we're gonna continue to contribute to it. Um, and this idea of just kind of stepping outside of it somehow, this fantasy of stepping out, uh, outside of it um, is actually fairly dangerous, I think. Um, and then lastly, uh, we need to understand how traditional aesthetic strategies work against us being able to confront the problem. Art is, a, um, is about separating something off from the world, but the challenge, as I've mentioned before, is to see how everything hangs together and is connected. Several theorists have commented, many theorists have commented, on how difficult uh, the representation, particularly of climate change, um, is. Returning back to, to David Wallace Wells for a second, he talks about how climate devastation is everywhere you look, but, never, but hardly ever directly addressed in, in art and literature and, and in film. That uh, much rather, we would much rather deal in fictional apocalypse, that is displacing our anxieties about global warming into theaters of our own design and control, as he puts it. Amitav Ghosh um, puts it this way, in a substantially altered world, when sea level, when sea level rise has swallowed this, uh, the Sunderbounds and made cities like Kolkata, New York, and Bangkok, uninhabitable. When readers and museum goers turn to art and literature for our time, they will not look first and uh, they will look first and foremost urgently for traces and portents of the altered world of their inheritance. And when they fail to find them, what should they, what can they uh, do other than to conclude that ours was a time when most forms of art and literature were drawn into the modes of concealment that prevented people from recognizing the realities of their plight? Quite possible then, uh, this, which um, uh, I've dropped something out here, <laughs> quite possible then uh, this uh, year, I'm not sure what that was supposed to say, uh, which so congratulates itself, oh, this era, sorry. It's quite possible then this era, which so congratulates itself on self-awareness, will come to be known as the time of the great derangement. Um, our art has not been up to, uh, to the challenge to really represent this uh, to ourselves. So after this uh, fairly lengthy introduction, uh, I'd like to spend um, a few minutes thinking about how the Anthropocene forces us to think about representation differently, and then go into some specific examples of film that we are showing this semester as part of the International Cinema's uh, Anthropocene Cinema Series. The idea of this series was to put together films that were not environmentalist per se, in fact, we, we really tried to shy away uh, from those kinds of films, rather films that significantly engaged from a wide variety of approaches, uh, the ways that, hum that humans related to that which surrounds them their environments, both constructed and natural. And we wanted to choose films that engage the very questions of thinking through the Anthropocene that I've just enumerated. So these are the films uh, from the series. I'm not gonna talk about all of them. There's not uh, time to, uh, to do that. Uh, I'm gonna focus mainly on the ones that are, um, that are bolded here. Um, hopefully some of you have had a chance to, uh, to see uh, some of these films. Um, I'll just mention the ones that, that I won't talk about um, just briefly here to give you a sense of what they are. The Cordillera of Dreams by Patricio uh, Guzman. Um, he's a Chilean filmmaker uh, who's been working in exile since uh, the, uh, the um, overthrow of the Allende government in the early 70s. Uh, and his films, this is the third in a series of films that all have to do with place. Um, that you have nostalgia for the light, um, the, um, What's the second one? The Pearl Button. And then uh, this third one, The Cordillera of Dreams. And uh, Nostalgia for the Light deals with the Atacama Desert, uh, the Pearl Button with the ocean, and now this is with the mountains. And there's a lot of interesting echoes and parallels to, to our own mountains. Uh, but he wants to read place as being tied up uh, with this really problematic history in, in Chile. Uh, and the, the the kind of violence that came with the uh, uh, with Pinochet and the overthrow of uh, Allende's government, uh, and it's this uh, experience of place and the way that uh, place is uh, is understood that was interesting to us. Um, 
El Rio, um, Anthropocene, I'll, I'll talk about here in a, in a minute. Um, El Rio, I won't in, in detail. This is a documentary by Juan Carlos Galeano uh, about the Amazon uh, River Basin and the people who inhabit it. This is a really important part of, of our series, I felt, because it gave uh, voice to uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, so much of the, the discourse um, is determined kind of by, by Western, kind of Northern um, uh, you know, scientist and theorist of, of different kinds. And so to, uh, this film really tries to give the people who live on the, you know, the river uh, an interesting kind of voice. Uh, the Gold Rush by Charlie Chaplin. Um, this is a film that maybe some of you know. Uh, this is a, a film that we put in there to invite us to think about it in a different kind of way. Uh, one of the things that's going on in this film I think is interesting is this tension between found and built environments. Uh, and of course all of the gags are all built about this kind of human um, engagement with place, the way that um, uh, place kind of exerts this sort of, of pressure that at times Chaplin is able to, you know, through his you know, acrobatic skill, um, kind of navigate and sometimes it's completely overwhelming to him and in a lot of ways that this is an interesting articulation of, of modernity, um, I think. Uh, Genesis 2.0 is a documentary about uh, cloning mammoths. Uh, so the, the melting tundra in the Arctic is revealing all of these mammoth remains. There's a huge market for mammoth tusks, um, uh, particularly in the Far East where they're used both for medicine as well as for art. And uh, the people who collect these tusks that live in Siberia have a, um, an interesting relationship that there's a lot of interdiction in their culture, uh, traditional culture about uh, touching uh, even the uh, you know, these remains of, of mammoths, and yet some are, are profiting by it. Um, because it's in the process of melting that they have recently found uh, actual tissue of, of mammoths that has uh, DNA that they think might be uh, sufficiently intact to be able to clone. And so this film begins there and then it goes everywhere. It ends up in South Korea and China and the United States. And critics of the film say, oh, it's kind of sprawling, but that's the exact point, is that this one kind of issue it shows is related to all of these other uh, really complex uh, sorts of issues. Uh, Hunt for the Wilder People uh, by Taka Wititi is uh, I put in for Rick Gill almost entirely, um, <laughs> and for my kids who who love it. It's it's uh, both playful in in how it's playing with this kind of nature culture um, dichotomy, but there's also a, a, an interesting element of seriousness as we follow uh, Ricky Baker, who's a real bad egg apparently, um, kind of a juvenile delinquent who is having trouble finding his place in the world, um, and that it's uh, it's in this um, extended uh, trip into the bush um, that. Uh, he's able to kind of reestablish real meaningful uh, kind of human relations. And it's all done in, in, a, in, a, in a fun way. Okay, so let, let me, uh, I'm gonna be able to talk about some of these others. I wanna start with uh, Anthropocene. This is a, a documentary that uh, was made by Jennifer Bakeval, Edward Bertinsky, and Nicholas de Poncier. Uh, Edward Bertinsky is a photographer some of you might be familiar with. Uh, he uh, has had exhibits here on campus in the, in the art museum. He's had several other films that he's collaborated with, uh, with Bakeval on. Uh, the most notable of these, I think, is Manufactured Landscapes. He uh, photographs in kind of large format photography. Uh, he likes to show, not tell, I would say. Uh, and one of the things that he likes to show are the sites that have been affected by human presences. Uh, he's especially drawn to uh, what we might refer to, what he refers to as the industrial sublime. That is, this idea of the thing that kind of overwhelms you. And you get a little bit of a sense of this um, here that we're looking at uh, the Carrera uh, marble mine in Italy. This is the same um, uh, quarry where uh, Michelangelo got uh, the, the marble that he used for some of his most famous statues. Uh, it's still an active quarry today. And as you can see, a large part of the mountain is simply missing, okay? That each of these, um, these little blocks are, I mean, I don't know if you can get this, the sense of the scale of the, of the trucks that are driving around. I mean, it's, it's on a scale that's hard to, you know, to fathom. What this uh, film is interesting for, I think, is one, it actually uses the, def uh, the working definition of the Anthropocene Working Group that I alluded to earlier to structure the film, where it looks at uh, questions of terraforming and um, I, I can't remember the four categories that it, uh, that it comes up with, but it uses that as a structure to kind of go through uh, the world and to look at how humans 
are, are not just kind of altering on a, on a small scale, but on a scale that's difficult uh, to imagine. And so it actually uses the camera to play with your sense of scale uh, continually, where you'll start, um, and there's a, a great sequence um, actually here in the quarry, where you start looking at an individual person, and then uh, the, the camera on, is on a you know, drone or something, and it, it kind of pulls back, and you begin to get a sense of the enormity of what it is you're looking at. And it does this several times, where you'll look at something, and you're not quite sure what to make of it. Uh, there's something aesthetically interesting about it, and then you kind of pull back and you see it in a different kind of frame. It does this both um, spatially and temporally. It really wants us to think about uh, time scales. Um, and um, it's also interested in uh, notions of complexity, the way that things are interconnected as it moves from one, one thing uh, to the other. And I think that um, a really interesting Here's, uh, here we have the, the mine. We'll get images like this, right, where uh, it's hard to tell what it is we're looking at. Um, and as the camera uh, pulls back, we begin to understand that, oh, this is actually natural, right? And so we're invited to kind of consider what the relationship is between something like this and, and something like this, which is sedimentary um, layers uh, in the rock. Uh, he wants us to, he wants to use the, that is, Bertinsky wants to use um, the, the sense of the beautiful to draw us in, but oftentimes it's disquieting uh, what, we, what we find when we're, when we're there. Um, here we're in the uh, potash mines in, um, in Russia. You know, again, there's something visually very attractive about them, uh, but also a little bit uh, problematic. Um, The, uh, the, the picture that uh, I started with here of the elephant tusks, um, one of the women who are, who's overseeing the destruction of these tusks to make sure they never make it to market says uh, that I can't stop the elephants from dying, but I can keep them from becoming art. <laughs> and I think that this is, uh, this is an, an interesting dimension of the, of the film, that it's um, interested in the way that the, the marble from the mines also becomes art, right? That there's ways that we use all of these things and that the, the things that we use in and of themselves are not bad, but if we don't understand the way that they're connected back to, these, uh, to the extraction and whatnot, then it can be a real problem. Okay, I mentioned uh, El Rio, um, very good for uh, the indigenous culture's engagement with place, which is fundamentally different than uh, uh, typical Western engagements of place, anti-colonialist views to understand how uh, much of our uh, social and economic system is built on this colonial heritage of, of extraction of resources, right, where you, um, you, know, you externalize the, uh, the costs, uh, the true costs of, uh, of the way that we live. Okay, Still Life is a, is a, a 2006 film um, by uh, Zizak, Zizaka, whose name I never pronounced uh, correctly. I apologize. Um, it's a, um, it was important for our series because it's a non-Western example of an engagement with the, uh, the Anthropocene. The basic storyline um, is loose at best. You have two people, a man and a woman, who are coming to the Three Gorges uh, area to find their, uh, their, their missing spouses, uh, the spouses that they've become estranged from. Uh, their stories don't really ever intersect. Uh, they're kind of running parallel to each other. Um, but what uh, is found when they reach the area is, um, in, uh, is a region that is uh, being radically altered and changed. Uh, when, when he made the film, uh, it started almost as a documentary project. Uh, he, he had a one-page script <laughs> when, he, when he showed up and he started filming. And it's more about what's happening behind the characters than, than what the characters are actually doing. Uh, the, the, the narrative is incredibly, incredibly loose. Humanity here in this film has become a force of nature. So, of course, the Three Gorges Dam is uh, the largest uh, dam in the world, uh, and the... Uh, this is, uh, was filmed as they're destroying all of the cities that are now going to be submerged, right? So a lot of this is now, you know, actually underwater. And the, the characters are witnessing this. Um, what I think Jia is suggesting um, is that modernity is changing our relationship uh, to place. Uh, it's not only changing environments, but it's displacing people, right? And migration is at the center of this, and there's a real cost to human relationships, right? So the, the, the drive of the whole film is to try and reestablish the families um, uh, 
we have a kind of pre-apocalyptic landscape uh, that we have as they're tearing down um, all of these buildings that the, the film frames for us in really striking sorts of ways. Uh, the big question when everything is for sale is what have we lost, right? What is, what is the, the cost of this kind of modernity? Uh, there's no one bad person in this in this film. There's not one person that you can look to, not even the Chinese government, uh, to say that they're the problem. Uh, it's simply indicative of a larger uh, set of circumstances that we've created for ourselves. Something that, that jumps out from this film, here we have, this is the only um, time we actually see the Three Gorges Dam and the whole thing. There's a conversation, uh, kind of a, an interaction when uh, the woman finally finds her husband uh, in front of the dam. And, and that's it, right? It's not interested in making this kind of complex argument about, therefore, we should tear down the dam. It's, it's more complex than that. Um, and uh, because there's, there's good things that come from the dam, right? The dam is going to produce hydroelectric energy, which is, you know, is going to, to be much better than the coal-fired uh, power plants that it, it's replacing. Um, but it comes at this other kind of cost that, uh, that he's inviting us to, to consider. Uh, he's not didactic. Uh, you have to deduce what it is he's saying because it's not going to be spelled out for you. Uh, the camera work in still life is constantly on the move. It's panning across uh, both people and vistas. Uh, and, and these kind of slow uh, pans uh, across the... Uh, uh, across these scenes are, are really the hallmark of the film. Uh, there's something also surreal going on in this, right? That you get these moments where UFOs appear and it's never explained, right? So here, this, this building that's been in the background of several conversations, she goes and she hangs up, you know, the tank top to, you know, to dry here. And then after she leaves the frame, the, you know, this, it's actually a monument to people, right? Um, uh, half finished, it was never completed. It just takes off as if it's an alien uh, spaceship. There's this element of the surreal that, that he infuses into this as well. Um, Broken Hill Blues is a film uh, by Sophia Norlean from 2013. It's, it too steps uh, away from narrative. Um, that, and this idea of causality uh, that's so problematic, that's embedded within narrative, that this leads to this leads to this, it's more complex than that. And it can't be uh, represented in an easy kind of way. The, original Swedish title of this film is Ömhärtan, which uh, I, I think that the this international uh, title that came up with Broken Hill Blues is, is actually takes you far away from the the idea that's in Ömhärtan, which is might be translated as tenderness, it might be translated as, as like something sore, right? Um, it's tender in, in that kind of sense, or even vulnerability, right? Uh, and that these, these are all really important dimensions of what the film is getting at. It's set in Kiruna, up in the north of Sweden, uh, which is a mining town, and it's a mining town that's uh, under threat. Uh, the extraction of the iron ore for now almost a century um, has led to the situation that the, the town is literally crumbling. The, the mine has grown underneath the city, and the city um, is going to need to move, and this is all kind of a real-life uh, situation. With this as the background, we follow uh, the, the lives of, uh, of several characters, three teenagers and, well, four teenagers, I don't know, how many characters there are that we're following, I'm not exactly sure, because, it, again, you're kind of jumping from one to the other. Their lives um, kind of cross each other, uh, that, again, kind of gets at this uh, notion of uh, complexity. Um, but the um, but what they have in common is this place in which they inhabit. Uh, the film tries to stretch us um, in in terms of thinking. Um, not just in terms of human time, but in terms of a geological kind of time scale as well. And uh, we get um, several uh, instances here where, uh, you know, this is kind of the thoughts going through one of the, uh, the heads of one of the characters as they wander through the woods. You know, that water ran from the ice and the fish started to grow legs. They came out of the water to walk on land where there were already large forests. The animals and humans looked for a place to live, right? So trying to think kind of geologically and kind of deeply about the, the inhabitation of, uh, of this place. Uh, one of the young girls has, has a conversation with her sister later on that stretches this in the other direction. She says, what's my room going to look like afterwards? And the sister says, well, after what? Well, when no one lives there anymore. Well, you might get some trees growing in there and some grass, maybe some snow even in there. And we even get these images uh, later on in the film of a, of a house that's been overgrown with, uh, with vegetation, uh, as if humans, as if it's past the time of humans and that something else now is, is uh, taking over. Um, 
Constantly in this film, she's juxtaposing uh, images of, of the mine, of the tailings of the mine, of what we might think of as uh, you know, disturbed environments with natural environments. Uh, she's not interested in drawing a really clear-cut line between these two things, that she sees it more as a kind of continuum. Uh, the mine itself is a, a sort of symbol of globalization. It's, of course, not the people in the city who make use of the ore that come out of the mine, uh, rather, but this is something that's being sent all over the world. One of the particularly poignant scenes, oh, there's our, our house uh, being overgrown, um, is when Daniel heads up in the mountains, and the motivation for going to the mountains is unclear, um, but we think it might be to, to kind of get away from, you know, all the you know, the problems and, and the things that, you know, that attend him in the town uh, to get back to nature in some kind of way. And he takes a shotgun with him and he shoots a reindeer. And the idea seems to be that he wants to bring himself into close contact with nature. But as soon as he shoots the, the reindeer, you can see that he regrets his decision. He tries to, you know, in, in vain, he tries to save the reindeer's life. Um, and uh, there's this idea of culpability, right? That, um, that all of us are, are participants in the system uh, that makes the mine uh, viable. And it's not that the mine itself is bad. Um, it's bad for, for the people who work in it. Um, but we all need the iron that comes out of it. We depend on it for in different ways in our modern life. So a stark contrast to this um, is uh, another Scandinavian film, uh, The Wave, um, by Roar Utag from 2015. This is a disaster film in its most distilled you know, kind of a way. Whereas Broken Hill Blues is diffuse, where it's trying to distribute agency and causation kind of all over the place, none of that is going on with the, with the, the wave. It is as you know, kind of straightforward as it can be. Uh, the basic plot is that there is, in, in Norway, in some of the fjords, there are unstable uh, hillsides, mountainsides, that periodically uh, you get uh, different uh, sorts of uh, rock slides and avalanches into the water, which cause these tsunamis that go up the, the fjords and, and wipe out everything in their path. And uh, the film starts with giving us some historical precedents of how this has happened, and then brings us up to the modern day. And so some of these really picturesque places you see in Norway with the, you know, the fjords that the cruise ships go right up into um, are, are very vulnerable uh, places to, to this kind of uh, geological action. And so this, that's what this is about. Nobody believes the scientist, right, um, who's, who's warning them that something's going on with the mountain, something's going on with the mountain. Uh, and of course, it eventually gives way and there are 10 minutes to save the town, right? And uh, so this film, uh, it, you know, in some ways it's very much like a Hollywood blockbuster, um, but I read it very much as a, an example of that it's all about climate change. In every way this film is about climate change, but it never actually says it, right? Um, so you have, um, this is our historical precedent, it makes a point of the fact that our main character, he's, he's leaving his job as a geologist. He's a little bit underappreciated because nobody wants to you know, believe his crazy theories about you know, the way the mountain's gonna, gonna work. And he's uh, gonna go work for the oil company, right, in uh, Stavanger, which is, um, by Norwegian standards, the big town, right? And, um, and this, you know, kind of the, the presence of kind of fossil fuel and, and oil and, and his decision to work for the oil company kind of undergirds, you know, all of this. And it seems like a, a you know, a fairly uh, thinly veiled uh, allegory for what's going to happen. Uh, humans are dwarfed by nature uh, in this film, right? And you get this constantly kind of taking advantage of this really spectacular landscape to, you know, to illustrate the way that nature has a kind of agency that cannot be controlled, uh, that it's going to, to strike back, and when it does, it's going to hurt. Um, I'm going to end uh, comparing these, uh, just real briefly, uh, these two films, um, Aga, uh, which is set in uh, Siberia, kind of within, within indigenous Indigenous Cultures in Siberia, and the film Arctic, um, which is a uh, Danish, Icelandic, American co-production starring Mats Mikkelsen. Um, Aga's um, follows the life, and it doesn't over-explain, of these two, um, these two people that seem to live outside of time uh, on the, in the far north of, of Siberia, hunting, fishing, kind of going about their, their life. We understand that their daughter is left, but we don't understand why she left. We understand that it causes them great pain, but we don't understand how she offended them. Um, but it later um, makes this argument about how 
um, modernity encroaching on this traditional lifestyle um, has forced, has invited the daughter, better to say, to view the world fundamentally differently than they do. But you go through it all backwards. You don't start with the daughter and then work back to the parents. You start with the parents. Um, their dependence on the environment is, is apparent at every turn. Uh, and slight changes in temperature and uh, behavior of animals has, has really big consequences for them. Likewise, um, there's Aga. Um, likewise, in the film Arctic, we follow uh, Mats Mikkelsen, who is a man who's stranded. His plane has crashed um, somewhere in the Arctic, and he's, it's a Robinson Crusoe survival story. And what these kinds of narratives do, uh, these survival stories, is they remind us of connectedness, right? Uh, it's a chance for us to imagine the way that, stripped of all the things that we do to insulate ourselves from uh, the the you know, the kind of capricious nature of, uh, of our environments. Um, what, could we survive? Would we know what to do? Uh, that we're so overly specialized in modern culture that most of us would have a really, really hard time. And so this is kind of a fantasy of, of being able to do that. Aga does something similar, but with an indigenous culture, um, here we get to play Mats Mikkelsen, which is, you know, fun pretty much any day of the week. Um, this is the one I'll, I'll, I'll end in. I'll only be able to say a couple things. This was an award-winning documentary. I uh, won the, uh, the top documentary prize at Sundance last year. And um, it's, I, I read it as an Anthropocene film in that it really wants to imagine um, a different kind of relationship with nature. And we're familiar with the plight of honeybees. And a lot of the, the issues related to colony collapse disorder are the, the industrialization of, of honey. Um, in a lot of ways, that, that we've made it an industrial product. And what this does is this film follows um, in Macedonia um, uh, a woman who raises uh, or cultivates honey uh, in a very traditional kind of way. She comes into conflict with some of her neighbors that see the world very, very differently. Uh, it's a beautiful film, and it's, uh, you know, and it's trying to, you know, to argue for these, um, these more sound... Uh, cultivation principles that are, are grounded in a better understanding of the way that we're connected with the environments that we inhabit. But it doesn't do so in a misanthropic way, which is what so many uh, environmental films do, right? Humans are the problem. Here it recognizes that humans are always part of the system. And so even these neighbors that are kind of problematic in the fact that they just want to go and, and take all the honey all the time, um, that she works with them, right? And she engages with them in some really interesting ways. So to conclude, the challenge that climate change and other environmental crises present us individually and collectively are not just daunting, and I, and I don't think I'm being unnecessarily hyperbolic here, but I think we could also say unprecedented. Uh, I appreciate that the Kennedy Center is sponsoring a semester-long lecture series on this topic. Uh, their approach is the right one. It's global in scope and methodologically interdisciplinary. You are hearing not just from scientists and, econom and economists, but also poets and even the occasional humanities professor. It's very appropriate, too, that Brigham Young University, with its commitment to a well-rounded education, one that incorporates secular learning with spiritual understanding, is engaged in precisely these questions. The BYU Ames document says that the education you get here should prepare you to be the kind of people who, quote, can make a difference in the world who can draw on their academic preparation to participate more effectively in the arenas of daily life. They are parents, church leaders, citizens, and compassionate human beings who are able to improve the moral, social, and ecological environment in which they and their families live." Close quote. As individuals and as a species, we have always been participants in natural systems. We come from the earth, we depend on the earth, and one day our bodies will return to the earth, the very creation that God declared good. Embracing the idea of the Anthropocene simply means being more deliberate about acknowledging and leveraging this participation with humility and gratitude. At its core, the Anthropocene is a model for understanding humanity's emergence as a planetary agent and steward with an emphasis on scale and interdependency. It confronts facile segmentations of space and history by linking the local to the global, by stretching the temporal imaginary to incorporate geological epochs and eons, and by forcing a recognition of the intertwined relationships between God, his children, and the creation. Thank you. Uh, we can everyone can hear your question as well as put a thoughts and response. 
uh, introduce yourself, uh, tell us your name, what you're studying, and ask your question. I haven't depressed you into despondency, right? <laughs> Rex Nielsen, I study Portuguese and Brazilian culture. Um, Chip, I have a question about uh, if you think there is anything particularly, or, or particular about a Scandinavian approach to this, um, to the issues of climate change. Is there something about Scandinavian aesthetics or the way that these films differ from films that are made in other countries, other parts of the world, addressing, addressing the issue? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a good question. And um, the, the comparative nature of, of what international cinema is able to do, I just really appreciate because it, it helps to bring you know, these kinds of things to light. That different cultures ask different questions, they frame it differently. And so if the problem is that we're not able to see something, then maybe we need to look kind of adjacently at other cultures to help us to, help us to do that. Um, so Scandinavia, um, likes to tout its, its especially um, Finland, Denmark, and Norway, like to tout this kind of special relationship to, to nature. And, you know, and if you believe the propaganda, it's, you know, that it goes back, it's always been this way, we've always had this kind of close affinity to nature. I personally think it's a little bit more manufactured than that, but that doesn't mean that it's any less real to the people who experience it. Um, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, Scandinavia industrialized in a, in a relatively unique way um, in that it kind of had this leapfrogging um, industrialization, whereas in other parts of Europe there was this kind of more of a slow buildup. It was still abrupt in a lot of ways. In Scandinavia, it was really abrupt, and it happened at the same time that Scandinavia was forced to, to recognize that it occupied a different place in the world politically and historically than it or politically, economically, than it once had. Used to be kind of the power in the north. Now it's you know these marginal, you know countries up on the you know in the north that the real center of Europe was was elsewhere. Um, so all of that combined to looking to define themselves in a unique kind of way, right? As a kind of a neo romanticism was breaking through, and wow, we have this really unique landscape and nature that's distinct and has been preserved in a lot of ways um, because it hasn't been inhabited in the same ways that it has been in other places. You still have large tracts of wilderness in these countries which doesn't hardly exist in, in most of the rest of Europe. So all of this led to, yeah, to a, a different relationship to nature and to place that's part of the aesthetic. Um, it's a very place-based kind of um, aesthetic that um, they, they had the good fortune of not um, siding with the Germans during World War II, and so whereas Germany had to eventually distance itself from some of these uh, ideas about the way they're connected to, to you know, soil and blood and things like that. In Scandinavia, that was able to continue in an interesting kind of way, and, and you really do see it um, in the way that they think about their, their society and their, and their culture today. Um, uh, for other reasons that are more complex than I want to necessarily go into right now, um, there's a greater willingness to, uh, for collective planning, which has allowed for greater environmental action on a state level. Um, and so this combined with the fact that they have resources of you know, hydro and wind and, and some of these things, that they've been able to, to make uh, greater, take greater steps when, in regards to moving away from a carbon-based economy. Having said that, uh, Norway is an oil producing country, right? And they, they recognize that. Um, and uh, and it's, a, it's a complicated, complicated question there. Uh, my name is Daniel Rondo. I'm a strategy and uh, design major. Um, you talked a lot about being connected and uh, connectedness, and it kind of is more on like an international level. I've noticed a lot of time in film um, and in other ways, it's more on an international level and a lot bigger problems. Um, and it's kind of miss in community levels. How would you address that in like a community setting? How to make other people aware of how like connected everything is, and I guess if that makes sense. Yeah. So this this can happen on several levels. It can happen on a thematic level, right? Um, and I and I've tended to talk a little bit more thematics here because I haven't been showing clips. I was worried that well, one, I knew I wouldn't have time, and two, clips always go wrong in a setting like this. So, you know, it's worried that they wouldn't go. So stylistically, would be the other way you could talk about this, right? So on a thematic level. Um, stories that, that suggest connection across places. So in my, uh, one of my humanities classes this semester, um, I like to, to think that it was because I was just being prescient, but it really was just on the syllabus. We watched the film um, uh, Contagion by Steven Soderbergh, right? Uh, which is all about, you know, a virus breaks out in 
South Asia and, <laughs> and begins to spread you know, across the world. And you know, suddenly we're reading this in the news. Uh, one of the things that Soderbergh does is, I mean, this is thematically, that he's wanting to show how something that happens in South China affects us here, right? It's not so hard for us to imagine that because we read that now every day in, in, the, in the news. But of course, he was doing this before the uh, coronavirus was, you know, you know had, had come to attention. And the, the, the way that he does that is not only narratively showing how this leads to this leads to this leads to this, but also formally within the film, he tries to do this by creating this, this feeling of simultaneity, things that are happening at the exact same time. And some people have referred to this um, kind of technique as hyperlink cinema, where it's, it's almost like you're following hyperlinks around to see, well, what's going on there and what's going on there, right? And all of this, he wants to create that sense of simultaneity to, um, to suggest another kind of connectivity as well. Um, the problem when you get to climate change is that eventually you're going you're gonna to hit a roadblock in that you simply can't do it, that you, you approach what looks like chaos. Um, the, the kind of complexity that we're dealing with is hyper complex, which means that you get things emerging that you simply could not have predict through causal kinds of models. Um, and, and so I think that films that, you know, another way of getting at it actually is rejecting causality altogether in the way that some of these, these films have as well. Um, so these are all kind of techniques that you, you, know, you can kind of use either stylistically or thematically to try and suggest this idea of, of connectedness. And then there's still the traditional ones that are kind of the more the, the hippie kind of, you know, are, you know, aren't we all part of, you know, of one thing? I mean, that's another version of, of this notion of connectedness as well. Um, my name is Kaylee Lowe. I am a communication student, and I feel like I watch a lot of great films with these environmental narratives. Mm -hmm. um, but then I feel like the majority of the audience, including me, a lot of times we don't see a lot of action like following it, even though they're trying to portray these messages about behavioral changes. Um, there's not really a whole lot of follow up, I guess, or like we watch these things, maybe we feel connected, but we don't ever do anything about it afterwards. Yeah. So I want to hear like maybe what are some of your solutions, either on the filmmaker side or even as a viewer. What are some solutions in helping that like cinema become something that makes a real difference in these climate change issues? Yeah, so, um, well, uh, let's talk from the, the standpoint of consumers of cinema, if we want to think about that way, kind of spectators of cinema. Um, what is it that you can do individually? Um, I'm going to say something and this is going to sound like I'm going to contradict myself, but you have to keep two contradictory thoughts in your head at the same time. One is that what you do individually doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of difference in, in the global scheme of things, right? In the same way that what you do individually doesn't contribute in, in drastic ways one way or the other, so anything that you do to, you know, to conserve or to, you know, to not... It just, that's the fundamental nature of the problem. Now, having said that, does that mean that you shouldn't do something um, unequivocally, no. I see this as a, moral, as a moral issue, right? So even though my actions might not make all the difference, I am morally obligated to, to take care of creation. Uh, I don't know how else you can read the scriptures, right? That, that I, I see this very much as, as a moral and an ethical call, that I'm in a relationship to, uh, to not only um, other people um, that are directly affected by or indirectly affected by my actions, but other beings that, that likewise uh, were created by God for a purpose. Um, and, and, and that purpose is not for me to use in any kind of um, you know, frivolous you know, sort of way. I have to be deliberate and I have to be thankful uh, for what I've received. This is a, a moral charge. So on the individual level, this is, you know, even though it, sometimes it doesn't feel like it makes a difference, you know, for us individually, it's important, um, and it's important for our families because we believe that moral questions are inherently important. Having said all of that, what does make a big change is that the kinds of changes that, that we need desperately right now happen on a, on a greater level, right? They happen on, on kind of nation, on the level of the nation, of the state, even, even the city. That this is where some of the most important things, you know, happening, um, these are where the most important things are that are happening. And uh, if you're not voting, um, you are being irresponsible, right? If you are not taking these questions really seriously and holding your politicians accountable uh, for the incredibly stupid things that are said, um, then you are not being responsible and you bear a greater share of the burden. Um, and the fact of the matter is that your generations, I'm talking collectively the students now, are um, 
are more worried about this than, than ever before. I've, I've seen this and I've, you know, that, that there's a big change. I am not convinced that they're voting anymore. I'm not convinced that they're, that they're contacting the people, the, you know, the decision makers who make the decisions on the systemic level. Um, and, that's a, and that's a failing on, on my part and on their part that we're not doing more that way. So, um, so don't feel too despondent. Um, because you individually can't do that much. There's still a reason for you to do um, important things, but work on changing the system. Carrie Ann Rhodes, cinema fan and fan of the environment. <laughs> um, this is kind of a, <laughs> and his sister. Um, this, is kind of, this is kind of a personal question for you, but as you've obviously been researching over the years and studying cinema over the years, creatively speaking, is there a story that rattles around in your head? What would that story look like, whether to write it as a, some kind of novel or hmm. um, thinking about it in a movie form? What would be the story you would write? That's a good question. I think one of the things that intrigues me, I don't know what, I don't know how the story, the form of the story, but I know the kind of the, the, the core of the story. One of the things that really interests me right now is, is this question of complicity, right? That we find ourselves um, complaining about the problems, worrying about the problems, but, but also a part of the problem, right? Um, that the, you know, the, the things I use in, in everyday life, from the clothes I wear to the paper that, you know, I printed this, you know, talk on to the energy that, you know, powered my PowerPoint, um, all contribute, right? And, and it's, um, the, historically, I think that the, the response was, okay, tell a story about how you cut yourself off from all that stuff, right? That you feed yourself from it. Um, and I think that that is so disingenuous um, because I have to recognize at the same time that, you know, that all of these things that I just described, um, you know, that I'm using are, are also the things that have made like modern medicine, you know, possible, that have saved countless, you know, people from, from malnutrition and from starvation, right? I mean, that there's, there's a whole other dimension that you, you can't just push this into this easy, you know, good and bad, you know, kind of, you can't make it a dichotomy that way. So the, the story would, would try to express that in some kind of way, right? That the ways that we're, that we're all part of it, and it's not a question of stepping, like I said, outside of it, um, but kind of inhabiting it and, and helping to, to steer it in a more um, humane, more charitable, you know, kind of direction. But I don't know what that looks like. <laughs>